when the Greeks fought each other, they would pray to their own gods, and then they'd have a contest, and they'd see whose gods was the strongest. I love that we're back in like 300 BC, still with the same questions that we've always had. This is a fascinating conversation, and I, I'm glad we get a chance to break it down. Uh, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It will dictate how we live life. It will dictate the culture and the world around us. And he's right. You know, the Gre the Greeks had a view of God. The Bible has another view of God. And I think one of the things that we struggle through today is like there there's this there's this kind of modern rationalistic approach to maybe theology and even the Bible that I think we're not, it's not benefiting us. And so I wonder about this. Um, the, the Bible is story. The God has revealed himself in narrative because narrative and story and poetry have a way of elevating your imagination beyond what it could have done in just propositional forms. And I think about it like this, um, that in the ancient world, I, I wrote some of this down, and maybe I should just be reading from it. And the rational push is dangerous by itself. Humanism, human reason by itself is divorced, uh, being divorced from the supernatural and divorced from divinity is only going to lead us into the more chaos of self-worship. We see that going on in the world today. We're just, people are greedy, we're fighting, everybody's trying to get power and whatever else. I, I think about it like this. Ancient people marveled at things like lightning that we don't marvel at anymore today. And, and they came up with stories, ep, uh, explanations, narratives for what was going on in the natural world. They had supernatural stories to satisfy that curiosity, that, that want to know the question of why is it going on. And today we've kind of dismissed those stories like Thor hammering on his anvil because they're not true. And they're not true. But back then, when a young boy would say to his father, Father, I'm frightened because of the lightning and the thunder, the father would say to the boy, well, that's Thor. He's hammering on his anvil. There's a God with divine power, and we mere mortals shudder in their presence. And so we pray to the gods, and we live lives of worship to satisfy the God. And the child now has some parameters with which to understand this terrifying world that he is in. Today, the child goes to the dad, and the dad says to the dad and says, "I'm frightened because the thunder and the lightning is shaking the house and the ground around us." And the dad says, "Well, it's just electricity in the atmosphere. It's just static. It's electric discharge." Uh, there's ions, there's particles, there's, there's things going on. And he gives a very propositional, rationalistic maybe explanation, which is not false. It is tr true that lightning is electricity. But is it, is it, and it's the correct explanation. But there's no wonder, there's no mystery. Is there more to the young boy's question? Is there more to his fear? that needs an answer. And so we've actually, we're in danger of dismissing the actual power of lightning because we think we can explain it in propositional form. But here's my encouragement. Just go outside in a thunderstorm the next time it's raging nearby and then ask yourself, which story is more helpful to you in that moment? There is a God who is powerful and mighty who is hammering on his anvil, so to speak. There is a Zeus throwing lightning bolts. Okay, maybe not. But there is a God who is acting in human history. The Bible, we call this God Yahweh, the Lord God. These men are going to have that conversation. Is it God? Is it God's? What comes into our mind when we think about God? That is a good question to be wrestled through. So I love this conversation. I love that you're here right now interested in this conversation and willing to listen to me sort of babble for a little bit. Uh, which story is going to relate more closely to your actual experience of the lightning? Is it the explanation of static electricity 
or is it the explanation of a divinely powerful being that is in some way in control of the natural forces that are at work? Or is it both? Are they not mutually exclusive? I tend to think that it is the supernatural explanation, not divorced from the scientific propositional explanation that would give us a more powerful way of describing our experience. And not only describing our experience, but then telling us how we should live. The boy and his father could pray and live lives of worship because they understood that there was a God at work in the natural world. But the scientific explanation leaves us with nothing really to do. Because isn't it true that there is a God who is in control of the natural world and is in control of those positively and negatively charged ions? So maybe the ancient Greeks, maybe the people believing that it was Thor hammering on an anvil were not far, as far off as we are taught to think because they're silly ancient way of thinking about the world was petty by comparison to our enlightened rationalism that we have today after the scientific revolution. And I'm not mocking those things. I mean, in a way, I kind of am um, to sort of swing the pendulum back. But I believe that they are, they have helped us. I mean, I'm sitting here on a computer do, talking to you out into the internet. I mean, it's amazing, amazing stuff. But we cannot sacrifice one for the other. And I think we do need both. So that's, I think that's kind of where this conversation is going to go today. I'm glad you're with me. Well, there's, it's like that in, those, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the, in, the, in the Bible, as we say. But uh, uh, it's different, too, because our God is the only God, right? And that claim, that's revolutionary in ancient times. I don't think that... Yeah, that is, that is a different, that is a unique claim. The Bible is making a unique claim. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It will shape the way people live. So that's why we're doing this one today. The claim is being made in the Ten Commandments because he, when he says there are plenty of gods, the gods are there. You have to read them, read this in light of that. These. Okay, so what Jonathan Pajot says is that it, it's, it's not what is being said in the text. The text is not making this very specific declaration of I am the one and only God. The Bible actually does talk about God's plural. This is the God, and these are my people, but I'm still everybody's God, right? Yeah, he's the transcendent God. Mm -hmm. That's and it. And then there are lower gods, you know, like angels and all these other beings. There are exist. lower gods in, re in reality, in the human reality, yeah. but they're not really gods. Well, the, they're not really gods. What does he mean? I think, I think we, we struggle with this. This is the, um, our modernism is not helping us here. And I think, um, yeah, maybe some of these people in this panel kind of are, are, are approaching this conversation from, a, from kind of a modernistic, maybe even not, maybe not rationalistic, but just a, yeah, a very sort of like modern, straightforward, you know, we're going to have this figured out. Uh, there's not a sense of mystery necessarily. And Jonathan Pajot is an artist. And so he, I think that he, what he lends to this conversation is really interesting because it doesn't seem like he has to be so fixed on, on, on sort of propositional, definitional types of ways of explaining things. It seems like he can be a little bit more flexible. I don't, I don't know the man, but that's just my impression of him is that he can be a little bit more flexible as he searches for the answers or the definitions in that way, but, but they're not really gods. Okay. Well, yeah, then we struggle. That's, we would struggle with this Elohim, this plural form of God that's used in the old Testament. It, is it like some people think referring to a Trinity, maybe in the beginning, God, that could be, but then there are other places where it talks about gods and it's not referencing the Lord God. It's not referencing Yahweh. And so there are other spiritual beings referenced in Scripture with this, with this word. And it, it, 
<laughs> it triggers some people and and it should be like this is a very important conversation so it, so so these guys they get they get a little they get a little hot and bothered um because because how we understand god is very important well, exactly. this is I, there are this things is, that are worse this is a con it's a contentious point that i've noticed we has been kind of hovering in in the background we've not really settled it uh, are we committed to the idea that of, of henotheism the idea that there's a, there's a god god uh, yahweh Three, four, the God of Exodus 3.14 is the top God, but there are, in reality, not just in our human reality, our human imaginations, actual gods, or are we say this you is... You mean in the eyes of the Bible, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Moses? All, all, of, in, all of those, in some sense. So, so you... Yeah, uh, so here we are. We're trying to nail down the definition. We really want to pin this bad boy down. But then, but then Dennis Prager... It's like, okay, well, according to who? And I think, you know, Jordan Peterson is going to jump in. He, you know, he's the psychologist. He's going to, he's hopefully going to be the glue that holds the whole thing together. Um, maybe as he tries, tries to straddle, you know, two things drifting apart and, and, you know, see if he's successful at maybe bringing the, them together or if he falls. Uh, but yeah, instead of. <laughs> Instead of uh, going with the definition, and I can't think of who that guy, uh, his name, I'm, I'm, some of these guys I'm not as familiar with, but um, instead of trying to go with the definition that's being offered, uh, we, we sort of, yeah, we, we need more specifics here, who, who, according to who. Now, in the eyes of us, in the eyes of the Bible, in the eyes of Moses, and yeah, maybe it does need to be all three. Does, does the Bible present its idea of God in a way that could harmonize all of those perspectives. The God who is revealing himself, the author who is writing that down, and then the reader who is then reading that text. One of the things that makes me believe that the God of the Bible is real, is the one true God, is it seems like he has revealed himself in a way that can create some sense of unity in all three of those. Now, I would say that there's certainly like, I don't understand scripture fully. I don't understand God fully. So us as readers, we really need to press in and, and work hard and rethink and keep doing the work. Now, I don't know about Moses or the others who, who wrote being divinely inspired, you know, it seems like there are two authors. There's the divine author, and then there's the human author. And God used human agency, and there's even parts of the text where the author is very much speaking in their own voice and not speaking from God per se. And yet there's a unity in Scripture, and there's a unity of our experience as we read Scripture. The Bible has an amazing power that can't be dismissed, I think. You're Okay, so one by one, do you, uh, uh, it's a very fair question. One by one. Uh, analyzing it, so do we entertain the idea that God himself, the creator of the universe of Genesis 1-1, mm -hmm. believes there are other gods or believes that there are things that people worship and call gods? Be well, that, that frames yeah. the dilemma nicely. The, is it the first or the second? Is it henotheism or monotheism? So there are principalities and powers, there are... I think the Bible is monotheistic. That's what I, I'm, I'm totally yeah. with you, Dennis. Yeah, I know yeah. You, you. Yeah, so here's Oz. And, and I have a lot of respect for Oz Guinness. Um, in fact, Francis Schaeffer, who is one of the people that kind of like when I first became a Christian, he, it was Schaeffer's books that I read. I think Oz spent some time with Francis Schaeffer and is influenced by him. And I've read some of Oz's stuff, but, but he's also kind of coming from, a, in a way, a modernistic approach. I hope I'm not doing a disservice, um, but that definitely seems like he, he, you know, he wants it very well pinned down and defined. And I know the are, philosophers yeah. of religion make this <laughs> distinction. Is that uh, a I'm, I think the biblical yeah, view, that, that's the Lord right. alone is God. Yeah. The Lord alone. Yeah, that, and that's very clear. But you notice how everybody's starting to erupt a little bit. I, I like that. And we should. We should erupt. Now, I do think there's a part of this that says, okay, 
we can all sit around the table and talk about uh, ice cream preferences or something like that because there's not this like deep seated like my identity is not closely connected to my preference on ice cream but the the idea of god that's very personal to us that's very closely like that's kind of who we are and so it's okay we should get that we should be passionate about uh, this discussion i do think the the problem is we can be kind of rigid and we need to be a little bit more flexible like we're talking about the preference for ice cream but not quite that flexible you know we do we we want what comes into our minds when we think about god to honor the God who is actually there, the real true God, and not some human conception that I've come up with. And so, and because of that, it's not really my idea that I'm trying to like flesh out or defend. And so I can kind of hold it in the sense of like, I'm going to learn from Dennis Prager. I'm going to learn from Oz Guinness. I'm going to learn from Jonathan Pajot. We're going to learn from each other. And and that's a, I think that's a really good, healthy thing rather than, you know, hey, unless you come over to my side and, and believe what I believe about God, we can't have a conversation about that. I think that's too rigid. I think that's a little too far. And hum- Calvin's idea, the human heart is a forge of idols. Well, the we angels need are named gods we in need the Bible. Some, by the text. Uh, principalities and Princi- powers yeah. of Paul. No, but even the, the word. Yeah, the but the word word the people yeah. believe in those things and they do today. Reason. No, but the angels science. that God sends are called gods. By whom? I mean, the, the, the angels that are in God's service, are used, sometimes they use the I same don't, I don't know that that's so in the Hebrew Bible. I, so I, I, they're not called gods. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're not called gods. Now, I do think, um, where's a Hebrew scholar when you need one? I wish I knew the reference that Jonathan Pajot is, is thinking of. I, I don't know what he's thinking, so I can't speak for him specifically, but if we look at the word Elohim, this is from Logos Bible software, so it's super helpful. Um, We take the word God, and we're going to look at this word, the word Elohim here, and we're going to look at the usage of that word. You can see what he's talking about. It's used for God, gods, gods, uh, God, gods, capital G, gods. Um, And, you know, we could do more study and look at the context of this more. But um, what do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see, a div- I see divine, a divine being coming out of the earth. So we're not talking about Yahweh, the Lord God, but we are using that word, Elohim, that same word. And so I, I, with all due respect to Dennis Prager, I don't think he's correct that the, the the Bible doesn't use that same term to talk about angels or spirits, heavenly beings, divine beings. Um, it's it is here the word Elohim. It is it does have a wider usage than just strictly talking about the one God. That's the point of I think that that would be the clear point to to make is that it does have a wider usage than just the one God. The the. What about the, the, what about the Jews were not always monotheistic. What about the people but, who were sent to Abraham? The, the yes, angels. so they were angels. That's correct. Right, but they are they're on this. They're on. They're this. on a divine mission. Ooh. Right. So what are they? The, what's called angel malach is messenger. They're God's messengers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but what are they really? <laughs> so he's referencing this that passage where there are three messengers that visit Abraham. Some people believe that's like a prefiguring of the trinity um it, i think that there are some things um worth looking into that's what angel means too in greek it doesn't make as much sense of the universe if there are many gods mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know in in aristotle and plato they're not we, many gods right i guess well then we're faced with okay it doesn't make as much sense of the universe if there are many gods. Yes, if what we're talking about, what comes into our minds when we say God is creator God, is infinite personal creator of all things, then it does not make sense to have more than one of those. You can't have more than one infinite God. But you can have God, the infinite creator of all things, infinite personal creator of all things, and gods in the sense of spiritual beings maybe we have beaten this dead horse into the ground too much but that that i think is 
Now, but his question, which makes more sense of the universe? Which makes more sense of reality? I think there is one infinite personal creator of all things and that there is a divine council of spiritual beings, some good, <laughs> there are some that have fallen, and, and we have this spiritual warfare going on, right? And there's this whole supernatural realm or, or spiritual realm, metaphysical realm, that if we ignore that, we don't have a good explanation for reality. We have a, we have a limited explanation. So on one sense, I, I agree with him. Yes, the one God is the best explanation for reality. But then there's other things that are left unexplained if we can't also incorporate what Scripture is telling us, which is there are these Elohim, these these gods, these spiritual beings that are also very much real. They're not they're not analogies. They're not just uh, <laughs> the Bible talks about them as being very real. And we would do well to consider that and allow that to give us a more full picture of reality. So Thorny, that fundamental motivational force, which is a spirit that abides within, but that's also transcendent. Uh, are they God in the, in the biblical sense? I would well, say I they would know. be idols. No. Well, but they, no, they, yes and no, because they, they also have a reality. Sense. They're right? higher yeah. than us. Yes. In the Old Testament. Oh, so, so then it becomes, Daniel, it becomes semantics. Like in the book it's semantics. Of Daniel, I think we are I think we're at semantics here. No. So you believe that there are principalities that act upon yeah, us right. that are beyond human scale. Yeah. But you don't like that we call them gods, I'd say. No, we like, make you think that the old gods. gods yeah. that we the make old... colon gods, but they're not gods. But they have existence. Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. super but then we're fine. We're super Okay, we agree. Okay, agree. Yeah. And yet the Bible still does use that term. So I think there, there is a resistance here, and I get it. I, I you know, again, I, I appreciate Oz. I think he's coming at this from a good place, but I also think it's like, it's like scary to like start thinking, oh, oh well, I'm a, I'm a evangelical Christian. I can't be talking about polytheism. You know, I can't be doing that. Well, no, I'm just, what is the, what is the text saying? And being, um, being deliberate and intentional about studying the text for what the text is saying and not going to the text with our own ideas. And, and if, and if it's pushing us and it's making us uncomfortable, like, okay, push in, lean into that. And maybe we get a more full picture. of what's So yes, we can call them gods, but they're not gods. But what is scripture saying? We just right. don't like uh, the fact well, that you I, use the word so God. Then we are agreeing in some sense that we're going to reserve the term God for the unity. That's fine. Of, we can use principality for and, the other. God says everybody the around the table is a child of the That's Bible. Fine. And that means we don't like to call many things God. Right. I'm just, I, I, I guess my objection well, was whether we call them gods or not, they have a proclivity to okay? act like they Everybody's okay Absolutely. Now. That's so. the biblical view of idols. So yes, yes. So yes. Well, powers in which we're making a... But it's deeper than that in some sense because you can think of an idol as just an arbitrary human construction. But what I would say instead, it's no, not. It's, it's the raising of a principality to the highest place. And so you say, well, my God is Priapus, let's say. And many people say that now. In fact, it's almost mandatory to say that. So but less than the highest place. Right. Yeah. Okay, we're starting to feel a little bit better, you know. Um, but yeah, it, an idol in the sense of like, okay, a carved wooden thing that I just invented this idea, uh, if, beginning from humanity, you know, just I'm, I'm going to come up with an idol. Which isn't necessarily the way idols had worked. It's like the ancient people were seeing forces in the world that they couldn't explain. And so they deified those forces. Um, and then so and then we say, well, that idol isn't a real thing. But the force that we're still perceiving is still a real thing that needs explanation. We're not comfortable with using the word gods to explain it. Okay, got it, you know. Because then we're in this sort of god of the gaps type of problem which maybe we're still uh, we're still there but I think I think everybody's starting to calm down a little bit in this uh, it's it's nice that they're getting a little frisky but now they're kind of calming down well, I don't know I want to know Dennis what do you think like do, is, do you have a sense of these the notion of principalities or demons is, is this something that you entertain in your worldview so I'm, I'm we're giving you hard you today, mean re yes indeed and I, and I'm, I See, do you notice what Jordan Peterson does there uh, this is so important when we're having conversations like this, it's okay to give people a second to breathe. He sees that this is a hard question for him to wrestle with. And it's being recorded and hundreds of thousands of people potentially are watching this. And Jonathan Paggio asks him a hard question. Are you, are you at this place? Are you willing to believe that there's things like spirits and demons and stuff like that? And um, I just love, I, like, you notice that Jordan did that because 
because he has empathy. I mean, I think he it's good to have somebody like this to manage this dialogue. These are good dialogues to have, and we do get wrapped up in them. So having that little moment to breathe Honored. is, is, is uh, nice. Is it your dentist or your... Well, you're, the, I understand you're sitting Jewish. here, so I'm asking okay. you and you can answer okay. the way you want to answer. I'm, I'm a strict monotheist. There's one God, end of issue. There, there are no demons. There, there, even, I, I will say, though, to, the, to my own shock, the last years in, in, in the Western world have opened me up for the first time to the belief that there may, may be a devil. You're walking around. <laughs> the demon's walking around I, I, in the street now. I, I'm not kidding. I wish I were. There's no mm. levity to what I'm saying. Yeah. But it is almost impossible to explain uh, the... Mm the rejection of what is good and the celebration of what is wrong so radically and so quickly without recourse to some other well, force in the universe. I wonder how many people will empathize with Dennis Prager in this moment. I wonder how many people feel, feel this because he feels it. You can see that he feels it. I'm a strict monotheist. I don't believe in Satans or demons or those types of things. And yet I look back at the past two years and I'm beginning to wonder if there are some forces at work that are taking everything which is good and, and making it look evil and taking the things which are objectively evil and somehow elevating them to make them look good. Our, our heroes have become villainized and our villains have become heroes and the only explanation I could possibly have is that there's some dark force at work. I wonder how many people empathize with that. I think that there is a spiritual awakening going on. I think people are confronted by that. And I, I think that this conversation is so good because because our, our sort of modern enlightenment rationalism is is proving to not satisfy all the questions we have. We It doesn't give us a full-orbed explanation of the world. And people are wondering, like, hey, man, there's more to life than this, right? Please tell me there's more to life than this. And I... I feel that in Dennis. I think that a lot of other people feel it. I really appreciate. Again, you notice that Jordan Peterson just gave him a moment to to pause, to breathe, to capture, to recapture his thoughts because you can tell that this does challenge him and he does feel it deeply. And even though the people around him kind of started to chuckle a little bit, um, because I think that they feel the same way. You look at the world and you go, yeah, there's some darkness going on. Anger in you is similar to anger in Steven or in me. And because it's similar, it, it, it has a... It transcends it has a, the There's a being that, that's a... It's hard to... It's hard anger to, exists people, even if you die. That's right. There's a good way to say it. That's right. right it's, yeah. it's, it, anger is something oh, that yeah. grips you. It's, and so it's got a reality that transcends you. Then how do I control it? Why am I responsible? Well, if, I, if I act... That good question. And that's why dialogue is important. Now, Evilly in anger, and anger controls me. I have, I have an excuse. Well, the, my yeah. answer to that would be: it's the bottom um, up and I top don't, down. Thing I, don't, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what to say about that. Apart from the fact that there are other forces within you, including you, that give you the ability to control it, even if it has some autonomy of its own. Like you don't have to give yourself over to anger, even though it beckons to you. You know, and you mm -hmm. remember in the story of Cain and Abel. Think, think about how that sets itself. Up. This is a, the, uh, this is the good, uh, a good example. Uh, I think this is the right bi biblical passage oh. to look at. So Cain is resentful and bitter and angry. And, and the reason for that is his sacrifices are rejected. And then sin sits at his door, like it's, it's externalized as a tempting spirit, and he has to invite it in. You know, it's the same idea in, in stories of vampiric mm -hmm. possession, is you have to invite the, the vampire through the window. So I would say you can open yourself up to this possession or decide not to do it. And th there's an element yeah. of free choice in that for sure. And yeah. this is why God calls Cain out. Yeah, so that's why we're still r responsible. There are forces acting maybe upon us, but um, it, you see, sin is crouching at your door, and God and God tells Cain, "You must master it. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and it is desires for you to master you, but you must master it." So it is, in a sense, something external, but it is internal. We have that choice. I mean, isn't this reflected in the decision that his mom and dad made, right? They were tempted by that fruit, but the eating of the fruit was where they fell into sin. And the, the Cain and Abel story is very ambivalent in some way because it isn't exactly mm. obvious why God rejects mm. Cain's sacrifices. Mm. And I love that about the story Hang because people fail in life and it's not exactly obvious why. And they get bitter and resentful about it. And then you might say, well, does that justify, because they're hurt so badly, because they failed, does that justify their, 
their vengefulness. And the Cain and Abel story says, no, it sets them up for it. That spirit of sin approaches mm -hmm. them, but they still decide whether or not they're going to open the door. Doesn't it say that he brought an inferior sacrifice? Yes, yes, but so it does. So it does explain why, why well, God it, it, preferred it, 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 No, it doesn't exactly say that, Dennis. It, it says that, it says that uh, Abel sacrificed. Okay, again, we need we need a Bible scholar. We need a Bible scholar here. Sacrifices of the highest quality. Yes. And it implies that Cain is lesser, mm -hmm. but it never really explains what he's doing wrong. Okay. True to some extent. The Bible sets you up to intuit why Cain's sacrifice was inferior. So, what is it setting up? The Bible tells us that this is good, and this is this is towards the end here. We're wrapping things up. If you're still with me, you've made it to the best. I think this is the best part. So you're with me. Thank you for being here. Would love to hear your comments at this point. Um, the Bible sets the story, and and classic classic literature does this as well. It leaves you to intuit the rest of the story. And in, in scripture, we just, we're just trying to interpret. We're trying to say, okay, what is this? What is this actually telling me, even though it doesn't tell me everything? So in some sense, I, I agree, Jordan, he was the keeper of the flocks, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. This is very important. This is very important. The Bible doesn't, it's not making a mistake here. It's telling you that Cain was a tiller of the ground on purpose. It's telling you that Abel was a shepherd. It's telling you that on purpose. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought offerings to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel and his part brought the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. So Cain is a man of the earth. He's a man of the ground. Abel is a shepherd of life. Okay, I'm not, I'm not expanding too much, I hope, of this passage, but, but, but watch what Scripture does. Okay, so, but, but, so and, and the Lord had regard, this is important, had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering, no regard. The idea here is that God looks, he's looking at Abel's sacrifice favorably, and he is not looking at Cain's sacrifice. The Bible is telling us that God is looking at Abel's sacrifice. So we need to look at Abel's sacrifice. And when we, and when we look at Abel's sacrifice, we see that he brings the firstlings of his flock. His sacrifice, Abel's sacrifice, is a sacrifice of the innocent life on behalf of the guilty. That's why God has regard for it. God is saying, Abel, he gets it. He gets what I'm doing. He's a part of my story. He's engaged with what I'm doing because God is going to do that. He said as much in Genesis 3 that, I, that the offspring of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent and in so doing bruise his own heel. So there was this innocent who got wounded for the sake of crushing the serpent. So, so Cain knows this story. Abel knows this story. And yet Abel is the one who brings the offering, the sacrifice of the innocent life on behalf of the guilty. And Cain brings an offering from the ground. He brings, in a sense, an earthly offering. Um sacrifices and burnt offerings I do not desire, but a broken and contrite heart. I've sort of paraphrased that passage. I'll leave a reference in the description. But that's what God wants. He wants the, that broken and contrite heart. That's what Abel offers him. So that was a good dialogue. <laughs> that was a good dialogue. And I appreciate you being here. And I want to continue the dialogue. We unpacked a lot. We unpacked sort of the supernatural, supernatural and the modern kind of rational, naturalistic explanations for things. But ultimately, I hope we landed on this. This. Um, 
that the way we, just like Abel, the way we live needs to be a accurate reflection of who we truly believe God to be. And who we truly believe God to be needs to be as close to the actual God who exists. Because what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's going to influence and even control or dictate how we live this life. And you can see the world around you losing its ever-loving mind. So we need to recapture a heavenly vision for who God is and who we are in relation to God so that we can live a life that is worthy of the, the worship that we can do for, for God, but worthy of what God has created us for, which is ultimately for his worship. So I hope that, I hope that you're still here because I love this stuff, man. And, and if you're still here and you love this, I would love to hear more from you. And if you know people who would benefit from this dialogue, share this because I think we need more of this. We need tons and tons of people doing stuff like this and having these dialogues. So I appreciate you and I'll catch you in the next one.